who works with the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And Kevin's gonna address the issue um, invasives. Uh, so Kevin, if you're ready to, to take over, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Frank and Adam and John and Lindsay and Rebecca for inviting me. Um, let me see if I can get my screen up here for a marvelous journey into invasive species. So yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this talk will be a um, focused on invasive species in Virginia with many tangents uh, in many different directions. Hopefully I'll be answering questions you have. I will not be talking a lot about fire, but maybe in your questions at the end, we'll talk more about fire. And uh, on that point, I'll probably be drawing on the many um, wonderful experts in this uh, council to um, address some of those questions. What I'm gonna do is give a background and overview, introduce you to a few species you may not know, but should, or you may know a little bit, but you probably should know more. Um, one thing about that we all know about fire is it is a disturbance and invasive species are well adapted to take advantage of disturbance. And so as we introduce uh, disturbances across the landscape, we're introducing opportunities for invasive species to become established, uh, including at many of our um, beloved places, naturally preserves, wildlife management areas, uh, state forests and the like. So um, what I wanna also, because this is such a diverse group and so many people have gotten, there's so many different uh, ideas and definitions and approaches to what we call invasive species, I'm gonna um, try to answer this question or at least let you know how I answer this question uh, to give us all a place to um, um, have a common understanding uh, for more nuanced uh, conversation going forward. So what are invasive species? Well, we can't really answer that question until we ask what are native species? And so I ask you now, is this a native species? And I'll make that rhetoric so nobody has to raise their hand, but it is a trick question because you have to answer this question. You have to know where you are in time and space. There's no such thing as a native species without relationship to a place and a time. And so if we're talking about this red area on the globe here, including most of uh, North America and stretching up into Eastern Canada and Southern Alaska, and yes, that bald eagle is a native species in our era. Um, but anywhere outside of that, it would not be considered native outside of the range in which it evolved. Uh, and that is largely what we're talking about. A native species, native range will be the place where it evolved and moved on its own uh, across that range and uh, discovering new portions and habitats within that range, but discovering it by its own power or maybe assisted by things like storms, currents, um, other natural forces, not human forces. Um, how about this species? Is this a native species in Virginia? No, this would be an introduced species that was brought here soon after founding of Jamestown, probably cattle began arriving. Uh, and other domestic species that were well known in Europe. And um, we began bringing these species with us to this quote unquote new world. Um, and uh, yet this species being introduced, it does provide us many benefits and we don't question those benefits, but um, the species also introduced in a new, new habitat. This particular, you know, cattle, um, pretty well stay within bounds, more or less, or we keep them well healed in bounds we want, where we want them to be. But some species do jump the fence and get out. Um, once upon a time, you know, the, all, our, all our cattle that we have in the, in the West are from the Auroch. Its range was much of Eurasia. Um, there are a couple other um, ancestors to our native lives, uh, native I mean, our um, domestic cattle uh, in Southern India, I mean, in India and Northern Africa, but the Auroch is the uh, ancestor to most of these. This was its range. Now it's found, you know, the ancestors or uh, descendants are now found all over the world, but 
more or less, they stay in their pens and we do a lot of work to keep them there. But how about this species, honeybee? Again, this was brought here to Virginia um, intentionally and yet is naturalized. It has escaped cultivation, although we still do cultivation of it, but it also persists on its own in the wild. We know there's, it has many challenges, native honey, or the honeybees now have many challenges um, in the landscape. Um, but um, anyway, it can survive on its own without our assistance, it's naturalized. So it's an introduced species here in Virginia. It's naturalized, it's escaped cultivation, reproducing on its own in the wild. But for the most part, I've not heard anyone complaining about that being a problem. Um, we welcome our honeybees and the work that they do, and uh, we're very glad to have them here with us. Again, once upon a time, their uh, range would have been this area. There were like about eight species, seven or eight species, the honeybee uh, of honeybees, and this red range is now where honeybees have been distributed to through human activity, packing them up, putting them in ships, airplanes, what have you, trucks, and uh, taking them elsewhere. Um, so how about this species? It may be a little hard to recognize the leaf, but you almost certainly recognize the texture and the impact on the landscape of that uh, plant there. Um, kudzu was introduced intentionally by humans and uh, with a, several specific goals in mind, one to be soil erosion control, possibly forage for livestock, um, but it had, as they say, um, unintended consequences by introducing it into North America landscape from its East Asian native range. And it escaped cultivation and it uh, grew um, profoundly, profusely uh, with great fecundity throughout the landscape and, and now alters habitats, landscapes and impacts even if you can see this little, uh, this is not a hobbit house, that would have been a, a house or a cabin of some kind. And so impacting, kudzu now impacts forest landscape, habitats, all the species that you would find under this canopy now and impact in, impacting human structures, therefore human economy and economic interests. Of course, the forest is also another economic interest as is the meadow. All that is transformed by this one species. So it has these multiple negative impacts um, that were not what was intended when it was introduced. Uh, here's Kudzu's na native range in green over on the left in South and East Asia. And then it's been introduced to all these places with purple. Um, classically, we say this was the weed that ate the South. I'm gonna sum up some of these things in a minute here, but a few more um, examples of introduced species. Species may be introduced by humans either intentionally, like kudzu, or accidentally, uh, like this the species I'll talk about next, which is not these trees, which some of you might recognize as American chestnut that once upon a time used to grow like this here in Eastern United States, uh, but no more. Um, it was a major component of our forests in the East, a uh, major economic component in our natural resources world, and had this range um, where it was a dynamic and important part of the Eastern forest habitats and communities. Uh, but because humans, because of the things we do, we like moving things. We move a lot. We like moving things with us. And even though we have this lovely native chestnut, um, some of us knew about, oh, there's some very nice Japanese chestnuts. There's some very nice Chinese chestnuts. Why don't we bring those here, sell them for landscaping and horticulture and what have you. And along with that came a, a fungus um, that caused the chestnut blight. And many of you probably know this story, but it is an example of a story that repeats over and over of a, an invasive species introduced accidentally through in good intentions, but maybe not with enough um, consideration about what might be consequences downstream. Um, then we have our emerald ash borer, another accidentally introduced species. Um, 
This is the kind of thing that is happening more and more because of our globalized economy and the massive amount of material we're moving around, not just the things we intend to move, but something like this creature, which was embedded in um, the wood and shipping pallets and arrived in uh, Michigan sometime in the early O's of this century and uh, has now spread throughout much of the e Midwest and making its way into the East and Southeast and has done a lot of devastation already in Virginia, which I'm sure you're already familiar. So let's uh, sum up some of this to have a kind of working conceptual concept of what an invasive species is. Because again, people get this a little muddled, um, but first let me just read through this and uh, um, go from here. So species that are introduced accidentally or intentionally by human activity into a new range and cause or have the potential to cause ecological or economic harm or harm to humans. So there's three key words in this definition that you have to remember if you wanna be talking about invasive species, uh, at least with me, um, introduced by human activity, ecological or economic harm. So introduced by humans causing harm. Just because it's non-native doesn't mean it's necessarily causing harm. Um, and we have to also show that harm, like what is the harm? And that's a good part of what I try to do in creating the Virginia uh, DCR invasive plant list, doing invasive plant species assessments and establishing the evidence, or at least uh, what I do, basically, I, aggregate the evidence for certain species that are causing ecological harm. Uh, so let's run through a little, a few numbers uh, just to, well, this is actually not what that run, but anyway, this is a one number, um, a large number, $120 billion. And this is the estimate of do US dollars per year in uh, damages, losses, and management costs that are brought about by invasive species or um, species that have been introduced, again, intentionally or unintentionally, and are causing a range of damages. And this includes all taxes, not just plants, not just insects, not just pathogens, all together. This study was done in the early O's, 2006, I think it was updated. And that was the last time we've had a really uh, comprehensive, good comprehensive economic impact study on invasive species overdue. I'm hoping someone out there is working on it. But um, anyway, for a little more context then, once upon a time, I mean, why do we pick, you know, the arrival of, or maybe the beginning of the, what we call the um, Columbian exchange, when Columbus proved ha, ha, the, the world was round and, um, uh, and opened up the world to a uh, um, and for many factors, uh, uh, a very busy world of trade and exchange and movement over the past 500 years. In the previous, I don't know, four and a half billion years, um, things moved much more slowly on planet Earth and had a great many um, obstacles for the movement. So things would have evolved in Africa, uh, took a, quite a long time to get to, say, South America, et cetera, and so forth. And we all know this and the various kinds of large landscape features of oceans, mountains, rivers, all these things separating species. And then along comes one species that is very good at moving. We'll get to that in a second. But, and, you know, again, great scales of time everywhere on earth almost uh, is been quote unquote invaded by life. Uh, and so even new islands emerging in uh, faraway places become green relatively quickly um, in the geologic or evolutionary scales. Um, but on a little island like this, you would not find elephants or hippos. Um, and uh, so some species can find their way around very easily, others cannot. 
our species, of course, very good at getting around after we um, got on our feet and started building our boats after about, I don't know, what is it, uh, 300,000 years as Homo sapiens, we finally figured some things out, start moving stuff around, great quantities of it. Um, there were still challenges here and there, vast oceans, dragons, big problem. We got better at moving around things, um, but still there's problems, accidents will happen. Uh, and then in addition to accidents, all our good intentions, um, the uh, European starling, as many of you are probably familiar with, um, and many of us here in North America, not one of our favorite bird species, um, but how did it get here? And this is an example of a story of humans and their various perspectives and needs and wants and desires playing out in a vast <laughs> ecological um, catastrophe. So European starlings were brought here in the early part of the, or late part of the 19th century um, because of William Shakespeare. And in America, in the Gilded Age, there were these things called the acclimatization societies, which were striving to bring all the species found in the works of the bard to North America. And uh, among those species were um, European starling, which was named in one particular play, one line, one mention. I get me a starling and teach it to say not but Mortimer. And because of that line, we now have billions of starlings in North America. Um, also, we bring species here just because they're pretty. They um, appeal to our aesthetic values. When you put them up against a bunch of native plants, they look like very stunning. And yes, I want that in my garden. And uh, But then some of these species will jump the fence and begin propagating across the landscape in an uncontrolled way having a variety of impacts that we'll talk about in a minute. Sometimes species, again, we think will do a nice job for us like beach vitex, maybe holding our shorelines together so to protect our million dollar beachfront homes, but it doesn't seem to work so well. Other species like wavy leaf grass arrive, and which I'll be talking about in detail further on here, um, arrive again accidentally. So again, introduced by humans and cause harm. So put this in a bit of context, because how do we think about all this? Because we're moving a lot of stuff and, um, and we're gonna go on moving stuff. And to give a, uh, just some a sense of how difficult all this is, but you already may know, 400,000 is the number of plant species estimated to be on earth, 400,000. So keep that in mind. As we move along, we currently have around 18,000 species in the flora of North America. Now that does include introduced species. Um, and I'll speak more specifically about Virginia flora in a minute here. But that's in North America, 18,000 plant species. Since the time of Columbus, 30,000 plant species have been introduced to North America. That doesn't mean they're naturalized, escaped, or even causing a problem, but it shows you the scale of things and uh, how much we are working with and working to try to understand, cope with, manage. 30,000 species in a few hundred years. All right, currently a conservative estimate or of uh, invasive plant, or no, I'm sorry, naturalized species in North America, around 5,000. So that 18,000 plant species in the North American flora, almost a third are introduced and naturalized. About 500 species are considered or labeled or identified by somebody somewhere as invasive or a problem. Right. And in Virginia, our own flora is currently put at, and this is about to change, it's probably already changed, but anyway, 3,164 species in our flora and about 600 of those are introduced and naturalized in our landscape, 600. And yet 
on our invasive plant list, there are only 90 species. Why only 90? Well, one, I don't know that I could keep up with 600 species and we don't have much good information maybe on their impacts in the landscape. But the other thing is about those species, we have to show and know of some harm caused by them before we will list them as an invasive plant species on the DCR list. So sorry, I keep harping on this, but it, again, I frequently see even among colleagues that uh, an introduced species means it's invasive or bad. And that's not what I'm trying to say here. Um, to determine if a species is invasive is as simple as following this flow chart. <laughs> and uh, you might laugh, you might be crying, you might be bored, but it actually is simpler than it looks to a degree. And it's kind of three major questions that help us understand its invasiveness. Um, does it have suitable habitat? Many species that are introduced do not find suitable habitat here, so they'll, they'll be filtered out. Does it threaten natural resources? Many species do not threaten natural resources. And then can the species be eradicated? This wouldn't keep it off our invasive plant list, but it would um, let us know what our short-term management strategies might be. Anyway, I'm not gonna dwell a lot on this list, this slide you'll be glad to know, but apparently I can't leave it either. Oh, here we go. So this is a view from a newly acquired tract of unnamed land somewhere in Southeast Virginia. And here we see Chinese privet and wavy leaf basket grass living in harmony, <laughs> or at least mutually together in the same space at the same time. And it might in both these species, but particularly the wavy leaf, we're gonna, I'm gonna dwell on here in a few minutes um, because important for us doing prescribed fire, moving around in lots of different landscapes, many of them are treasured natural areas and the like. Uh, and this is a species that could be easily moved by um, fire um, fire activities. Um, not so much the fire as the our equipment, clothes, and uh, um, anything that the the seeds might move around on. Uh, just briefly, my uh, the assessment process that we use in natural heritage is derived from the Nature Conservancy, Nature Serve effort. Um, protocol called Invasive Species Assessment Protocol, and it was designed to be scalable to states or regions or what have you. So ours is, of course, scaled to Virginia. It covers a range of areas, basically four major areas of inquiry, totaling like 22 questions you answer and then provide citation and evidence for your answer, and that gives you a weighted uh, score and let you assess a species for its quote unquote invasiveness. Um, the four areas we look at are ecological impacts, like you saw. Well, I'll show some examples here in a minute. Current distribution and abundance, trends and distribution and abundance, and management difficulty. Um, so, some of the things we're asking here are like, does a species alter ecosystem processes such as succession, light availability, water, soil chemistry, hydrology, fire regime? Does it invade undisturbed natural areas? It's an important question. Um, and again, we since we also introduce disturbance with fire and other things, um, we become a ve vector for invasive species. Does it cause substantial impacts on rare vulnerable species? Um, is it widely distributed or generally abundant where present? And does it disperse readily to new areas? Um, and does it resist control? These are many of the factors we're looking at. This slide doesn't want to leave. Okay. So let's just point out a few um, maybe well-known species and um, talk about some of the, these impacts. So Phragmites australis, introduced here in the late 19th century, um, really to North America, it arrived in Virginia only 60 years ago, really less than 60 years ago. And this view of Back Bay shows that uh, Back Bay is now 
dominated by um, Phragmites. So all this green in here that is not trees uh, or water is Phragmites. And it is there altering ecosystem processes. It's um, changing the hydrology, changing the fire regime, changing um, light regime for any of the species that are underneath its 15 foot tall um, canopy. Um, here's its rhizomes spreading out and changing a wet area into a less wet area and altering the substrate there. It's um, very adaptable, um, can find a home almost anywhere and resists control. This is wavy leaf basket grass, um, which I'll be saying a little bit more in a, a little in a little bit further down. But again, this does what Phragmites does to a giant marsh. This can do to a forest understory, It'll carpet the ground layer, block light for all those smaller statured species, as well as suppress germination for overstory species, mid canopy species. This is a newer introduction to Virginia. We don't know exactly when it got here. We, our earliest record is 2000 and I'm sorry, 1995, um, but we only recognized it as a separate species. This is closely related to water chestnut and uh, um, a congener of water chestnut, which is Trapa natans. This is Trapa bispinosa or two horned water chestnut. It will alter an ecosystem like in a pond or slow moving stream or a, create a, a canopy and shade out light and alter soil or water chemistry and uh, begin creating havoc then in that community type. Two horn trappa because it's seed case has these two horns here. Here you can see it's germinating and sending out its first little root. Um, and it gets around how many invasive species have well-developed dis um, dispersal mechanisms. This one is these horns have a little tiny barb on the end, which are very effective at hitching a ride on things like Canada geese and other waterfowl. And so it's making its way across Northern Virginia right now, which is the only state in which it's identified. And it's currently in Fairfax, Loudoun, Prince William and uh, yeah, that's it. And there's a historical record in Stafford um, and, uh, but it's hopping from pond to pond, we think via waterfowl because many of these ponds are not the kind of place that humans are moving, but it got here to North America somehow from East Asia by human activity and now is being moved around by waterfowl and it will cover a pond and alter that ecosystem. So uh, just quickly, here's another new invader to uh, Virginia causing problem for one of our beloved species. Um, fortunately, this is much magnified and uh, it's a nematode and it um, causes um, beach uh, leaf disease. And we now have this in Prince William County. Um, and this is a new introduction or phenomenon. We're not sure exactly where it came from um, or if it evolved here, but it's new to Virginia and um, threatens our beach species. And this is a, what the leaf um, will looks like or disease when it's manifesting in the leaves. You can see these stripes of um, dark and light stripes between the veins on the leaf. This will be an indicator for you to um, ask more questions if you see this happening to beech trees on your properties. Here's a view from below. Again, you can see that striping, very dense, dark areas interspersed with the light areas. Going to be your early warning indicator of this nematode that will attacks the leaf buds, it will eventually kill a tree, generally smaller trees, but large trees and trees of all ages have been killed by this thing. Currently spread from somewhere in Ohio, throughout um, Southern Canada, east um, to Western New York and Pennsylvania, but is now in Con Connecticut and also as far as Maine and now in Prince William in Virginia. 
um, wavy leaf basket grass. This isn't really the main one. The main thing I think uh, I would like you to remember after this talk, um, if you are not familiar with this already, wavy leaf grass was introduced here sometime in the last 30 years, probably in the early O's. And that's when we first discovered it, I think in Shenandoah, then in a, a preserve that will go unnamed in Northern Virginia um, and has spread from those places um, along the Appalachian Trail and to a variety of places in Northern Virginia, Fairfax, Loudoun, Prince William County. Um, you can see up close the wavy characteristic of the leaf, which is the clue that you've got wavy leaf basket grass. And you note that these waves are perpendicular to the mid vein on the leaf. Those are really good indicators. This is an easy grass species to learn to identify. So even if you don't consider yourself a good um, botanist or differentiating grass species, you can learn this one very readily and it's um, important that you do. So here's a whole plant. They grow um, to about three feet long and length, three feet in length, kind of lay over um, and grow in these dense patches. You'll see here in a minute, there's a little bit of hair on the surface of the leaf, which can help you distinguish it from a couple close species, um, faker species. There's also these leaf uh, uh, plant hairs on the stem. Again, you can see that wavy undulating leaf. This species is called um, Oplis menis undulatifolius. So those are clues. You can distinguish it from microstigium in that the leaves are larger and has that wave action. The microstigium has the, that silvery white mid vein. And then uh, our native um, deer tongue has a much larger leaf, no regular waves on it. These on wavy leaf, it's a very regular pleated look. Deer tongue, it's an irregular wave. And then the leaf base on deer tongue is perfoliate. It looks like that stem is pierced the base of the leaf. Wavy leaf, it's just coming off the side of the stem. All right. And there's another comparison to microstigium. It's an easy one to be faked out by. And the two do actually interact. I include that. Anyway, they um, kind of fill in a forest understory in slightly different habitat. The, way, the wavy leaf loves deep shade. And the microstigium likes a little bit of edge and light uh, coming in. Um, so they sort of just fill in two areas <laughs> rather than out competing one or the other. Um, again, deer tongue, not so much waviness. And then one other species wavy leaf could be confused with is the um, joint carp grass or carpet grass, Arthraxon hispidus. The species is smaller, lighter green, irregular waves on the leaf, waviness on the leaves, and um, generally more an open, wet area habitat. Wavy leaf likes deep shade in forest and slightly wet forest areas. And then the leaf base of, or the leaf and the leaf base of the um, Arthraxon will be clasped on the stem and the hairs are neatly aligned on the leaf margin, not so much on the surface as is found in the wavy leaf grass. Wavy leaf produces these uh, stems with these seeds, with the long awns, the awns, this like little stiff structure here. Here are the, um, uh, this is early before it's <clears throat> formed to see this early flower. So um, he here you see it more going to seed and then the seed itself here and it will exude a sticky substance, which is not the morning dew on this picture. This is an exudate that will stick to any kind of critter that brushes up against it and almost any fabric. So here you see a researcher's dog who has run through a patch of um, fertile wavy leaf for 30 seconds and then 
graduate students were subjected to a seed count, uh, pulling all those seeds off of Harley, and they found in that 30 second period, 12,000 seeds deposited on Harley. So this is a marvelous dispersal mechanism for in invasive plant. So again, if you uh, see this, report this, and I'll show you in a minute how to report species. Um, so on fire, uh, an invasive species. Um, I'm just gonna say a few things which are probably very much in the minds of many of you, but maybe not everybody. So I'll just share this sort of common understanding. Throughout well, in the whole invasive species world, prevention is really number one. That is the best, almost assured way of um, keeping something from becoming established and then a huge costly and eco ecologic nightmare. Preventing invasive species from establishing in weed-free burned areas is the most effective, least costly management method. This can be accomplished through early detection and eradication, careful monitoring and follow-up. And I think many of you have that kind of thing going on. Um, so, um, this is just information from the Firefox information system. Their kind of list of things they think help um, keep invasive species under control in fire landscapes. And that fire training should do what we're doing now, include some weed and pre prevention education and fire training. You wanna minimize soil disturbance and vegetation removal during fire suppression and rehabilitation activities. I know a great challenge, but something to be mindful of. This is probably one we could all be better at, cleaning equipment and vehicles prior to entering uh, or leaving an area where you've worked. So currently there are several state parks, uh, national forests and national parks that have wavy leaf grass on it. And this is, these are all places where we do um, prescribed fires. So it is possible you're getting it on yourself, on equipment and what have you. So we really should be working on a kind of disinfection stage of uh, cleaning before we depart a site um, and definitely before we enter a undisturbed area. Um, and then reestablishing vegetation on bare ground as soon as possible, yeah, yeah. So, the two most important, I think, for us to remember and what we can actually maybe do something about detecting weeds early and eradicating before they spread through an area and eradicating small patches and contain, that, and contain or control large infestations within or adjacent to a, a burned area. So our monitoring system should include some early detection of troublesome species. And again, I know many of you are doing that. But if you do find something new or something uh, curious, you can report it. And the best and easiest way to do that is using the EdMaps app for your smartphone. This system has um, been under development for a long period of time. Many different agencies are using it. It's used by citizen scientists. It's an easy learning curve. And uh, again, you can have it in your pocket and it will um, allow you to to map and report a species. And that information will get to me and many other land managers, as well as be publicly displayed once the report is verified um, so that uh, word can get out about your finds. And uh, I think many of you know about spotted lantern flies, so it may not take a lot of time for this, but just to review, because um, this is another upcoming threat to forests and our landscape generally, as well as agricultural products and crops like hops and grapes and um, stone fruits. Spotted lanternfly is a leaf hopping insect. It looks kind of mothy there, but it's really a leaf hopper. It starts out its crawling life as uh, these nymphs. This is a black and white spots. Here's an early nymph stage. The red and white and black is the later nymph stage. They suck the plant juices out of a plant and end up harming it, debilitating it, killing it, as well as making it all very messy. They poop out honeydew, which then is attracts other insects and um, is a substrate for a fungus action. So it's quite a mess. Um, and uh, currently in Northwest 
Virginia. I think I have a map here in a second. Here's a mass of adult uh, spotted fly, lantern flies. So kind of blend in, but you can keep your eyes out for that and uh, report it if you find it. Here again is the adult with the wings out. In Virginia, this might not be the most, up oh yeah, it is up to date, that's good. Um, again, mostly Northeast in this portions of the state. I go, although now I'm seeing some new reports down in Southwest and in uh, Northern Virginia. It originated in Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, up here, and has been radiating out for the past seven years, I think, so maybe fewer. Um, anyway, it's just it's pretty recent and on the move. Um, so keep a lookout for that. Um, these counties in Virginia are currently under quarantine. So that means moving product out of those uh, requires a permit, um, but Warren, County and Winchester are sort of ground zero for Virginia and the spotted lanternfly. But it, I'm seeing reports of it popping up throughout Northern Virginia. Um, I don't know that it's been established, but people are finding in squashing and sending uh, photos of insects to me and others. So keep your eye out for that. Again, the EdMaps app, download it now. You can start ignoring me and just download it now. Register if you aren't and get to know this app and um, make use of it. Share it with your friends, family, um, and uh, have it handy. So I'm sure there are many questions I didn't answer. You can find many good answers on these websites. This is the invasive.org, which is part of the Bugwood Network, which produces the EdMaps app. And this is our Virginia Invasive Species website, um, which you can find more Virginia pertinent information there. So um, I know that was a lot of material in a short period of time. I'm um, open for questions. Um, yeah, <clears throat> thank uh, you, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah um, I just wanna thank you uh, also for now uh, we have another expert on invasive species in DCR to go to when their questions come up. And, and uh, I do wanna point everybody to a um, chat that Rick Myers from DCR posted um, and I think it, it's, uh, you know, I'm not going to read it. You all can read it at your own leisure. But Rick, uh, knowing that you're there, I want to just ask you one question. Maybe if you could talk to, um, if folks have concerns about invasive species and, you know, the eradication of it that Kevin talked about and using whether it's fire or herbicides or a combination thereof, or or as he said, you know, small populations, you know, mechanically getting rid of them. Any guidance or words of wisdom to folks on where they should go? Um, I know DCR is kind of the ground zero for the expertise in, in invasives and stuff. So um, you want to take that, maybe add to it a little bit? If you're still there, maybe had to jump off. Oh, there he is. You're muted, Rick. Unmute. Oh, wait, hold on. I need to, un un I will unmute oh. Rick. <laughs> I keep forgetting that I haven't used this feature. Okay, unmuting you now, sir. I think he needs to unmute himself, too. Ooh. There you are. Am I there now? Yep. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rick. Thanks um, for recognizing me, Fred, and, and good to be here with everybody. Kevin didn't. I'm not sure he specifically said this, but the whole idea of, you know, the use of fire and in invasive species management is, you know, it's, it's not a panacea and simply the case that there are species where fire can work into some sort of a management or control regime, but it's not a well-known field. Um, you have to understand the life history and the response of fire to individual species to be able to, to use fire successfully in order to to control any given invasive plant. And the example I, I talk about a lot is the one with Phragmites, where if you're able to burn Phragmites, um, you can, but you're just fertilizing it unless you use herbicides too. But removing the existing canopy and thatch in a Phragmites stand with fire gives you a better chance of getting to it with herbicides the, the following year. But if you cannot follow it with herbicides, all you're doing is 
encouraging it. So you have to be pretty careful with the use of fire um, in, in many invasive plants, especially the perennials. Um, and then the other one is, and there's little, if any, evidence in the literature to, for the use of fire in controlling Japanese stiltgrass, but we've, we've become fairly sure that if you can burn hot in Japanese stiltgrass stands and then follow with herbicide, you do more harm to the stiltgrass than if you just use herbicide alone because we think you're consuming some of the seed bank seed that, that stiltgrass is famous for. So it's really a species by species uh, look at the use of fire with, with controlling those. Kevin, anything else? Yeah, yeah. in preparation for this talk, I was looking through a lot of common invasive species and reading up on their um, fire response. And most of them, you just make them mad. You top kill them, but they come right back. And uh, um, so it takes other elements of management strategies to really control a species of fire alone. You'll either just it'll be continue the status quo, or you might enhance a species um, um, capabilities on a site. So it requires other attention than just fire. Um, and uh, I did wanna say regarding fire, the one big question I have regarding fire response is um, wavy leaf grass. And that's something we don't know the answer to. We want to know, and I want to know, um, what is wavy leaf grass's response to fire? Because it is, it, is a, it is a perennial, unlike microstigium, but it's very shallowly rooted. And I think it's put its, um, uh, its strategy into a sticky seed, maybe not a long-lived seed. We do know that the seed bank is now, we have some um, greenhouse studies that it's maybe around four or five years of a seed bank. But I have a feeling that the whole plant and its seed would be highly susceptible to fire. And I would love to see my, my I would love to see me proved right, but I, uh, I would love me to see me proved one way or the other. It doesn't matter. I'd just like to see someone put some fire on some stands of wavy leaf and uh, tell me what happens. Um, right, so any other um, questions, comments? Um, I don't see any right now, but... Uh... I'll tell you, Kevin, I, I, I want to thank you because, uh, you know, like you hear a song and it gets stuck in your brain and you can never get rid of it. Well, all I'm seeing now is your flow chart. <laughs> I have this vision of this flow chart now. Um, it was very, very sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, but yeah, it, I think it's very important. Some of the, the, the points that you brought up in your presentation, you know, is, you know, we have this huge perceived problem with all these invasives and whether it you know, is that reality? You know, you kind of threw a lot of numbers out there to us and where we're looking at, I wrote my note down, you know, there's like 90 plant invasive species, you know, recognized in Virginia. And, you know, a lot of them are, you know, a variety of, you know, magnitude of problems and stuff, but not just because everything's not native doesn't mean it's invasive and mean it's a problem. So I think that's... that's I think good. what's emerging is, is that, uh, you know, I think long ago, many of us that study this dropped the idea of eradication <laughs> um, across the landscape. But what we, what I think I hear is that we focus on places, specific places, and have clear management goals and do what we can regarding invasive species at the places we are responsible for. We'll never wind back Phragmites across the landscape. Um, or even wavy leaf grass, even at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, nature in the long run will develop its own ways of, you know, doing these things um, or dealing with these introductions. Um, life uh, finds a way, um, but in our human scaled and human um, goals, uh, human scale time and human goals at different places, we need to, we need to take action on certain species at certain times. But this will be very much a place-based and species-based questions and strategies. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of potential bad news out there, but if you keep focused on what is your <laughs> corner of the world to take care of, it'll be much easier to handle. And I'm just gonna um, ask or make a statement here and then see if there's any other questions and we'll go to a break. But yeah, I think it's very important too. Uh, Kevin mentioned um, in passing, and I hope you heard it loud and clear, 
is that when we're burning on a track and if there's invasives there, we need to make sure that we're not we're not adding to the problem of, of taking those invasives from track one and moving it over to track two. So, you know, cleaning our equipment off and that, you know, I can remember when a long time ago when I was doing a lot of burning and out in the woods a lot, you get all these bigger lice all over me and I would wait till I get home to scrape them off. Well, eventually I had a little crop of, of uh, that growing uh, around my home that I never had before because I took it there from these tracks. So, um, you know, just like uh, a lot of fisher, fishermen, they have to be careful when they're in one body of water and they're, they're moving to other bodies of water. They're cleaning their, their motors and their, their trailers and stuff so they don't drag the invasives from one, one point to another. I think if we could just be conscious of that in our, in our efforts when we're burning, that's, you know, a little thing like Kevin just said, in our little corner of the world we can do to help that. So let's see if there's any other questions. I see one from Ron and I just want to address quickly. He's asked, is there any information on the fire effects, negative or positive on some uh, of these common um, invasive plant species? And there is not a lot. And uh, it seems like a lot of invasive species, I don't know, and, and I don't know, uh, at least as far as in the fire world, it doesn't seem like a lot of research has gone on in the last 10 years. There's been a it may be here and there of stuff I don't know about, but um, it seems like a, a gap and a need um, to know more about specific responses. But um, uh, if you want to see what uh, one source is good, that is good for um, at least what was known up to, I don't know, seems like the site is not as well updated as it used to be, but the fire information effects system, FICE, um, that um, for U.S. Forest Service maintains, has a pretty good overview of all these species and an overview such as it is of what is known about fire response. Um, so that's at the U.S. Forest Service website and it's the fire information effects, fire effects information system. So you look up that and you'll find it easily. Um, and let's see, there's another question there um, tossed out and, and says, what's replaced chestnuts in our mountains? So uh, maybe Jean, I don't know if uh, you can maybe, maybe take that. Well, Lindsay answers, okay. All right. Um, and then yeah, just everybody can see the chat. Sam posted a good statement in there uh, on, on that. So, um, with that, again, I want to thank you, Kevin, for uh, you know joining us, and um, again being another uh, valuable resource as we we realize that you know our focus is is got to be beyond just putting fire on the land. You know what is it we're doing, and what are we impacting as we we move through the management of our our resources. So. Uh, again, and we're going to have Kevin's contact information uh, available uh, along with everybody else. Um, I don't see any other comments, so we're a little ahead of time, but I'm going to stick to We're going to take a little bit longer break, and if we could make sure that we're back uh, in front of our computers at 10.15, we'll kick off the next presentation, which is kind of timely with some stuff that's been in the news lately. So again, Kevin, thank you uh, for taking time and joining us.